Um, this is really exciting for me. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Steve Goldstein, and I'm the new provost. Six months in, still allowed to say new. Uh, that gives me deniab plausible deniability on any hard question. Um, so first, I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests and, um, and everyone um, uh, to this series of events over two days. Um, Brandeis has a long history of engagement uh, in social justice as an institution and uh, through the agency of our graduates. Um, many of our alums head off into the world of service. And if they don't head off into the world of service, many of them come back. And I was recently in New York at Brandeis House talking to older alums, well, not older alums, I, somehow I should say that delicately. <laughs> Alums who have been gone for some time. And they were asking if we could set up a network so that they could talk to each other about how they could exercise their talents and their resources in the arena of social justice. Now that they were established in lives, they felt safe enough to be able to turn back and look, and they wanted guidance. So it does seem to be a part of Brandeis um, and those who graduate. The institution has been focused on social justice since its founding. And that's really easy to say. It's less easy to know what it means. Now, I think I know what it means for me. Um, and if someone asks at some point, I may even tell you. But that's different than knowing what it should be for the institution. Um, and our strategic planning exercise that we're undertaking right now is really, part of it is to address, as we address what we are gonna focus on going forward, is asking the question of what does social justice mean in the context of what Brandeis University wants to be as it looks ahead 20 years from now. It's clear that it somehow has to be part of our tripartite mission, which is teaching to expand minds, scholarship that advances the frontiers of knowledge, and somehow, in some ways, service that impacts society. Those are the pieces that have always been Brandeis. So the International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life embodies that commitment, even as we search for what it means. Um, and it has been a forum for open and honest debate about what social justice should mean here and at large. It is a pleasure to bring to this conversation the perspectives of distinguished professionals from around the world. They honor us with their presence, and from them we have much to learn. So enough said by the provost. One day you'll tell me what a provost is. Right now it's someone who gets to sit in a very exciting room. I'd like to hand this over to our moderator, the director of the Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life, Dan Terrace. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. And uh, I guess uh, after six months, we can stop saying welcome to Brandeis. <laughs> but uh, welcome, this is the first meeting of the, our um, board of the International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life that. Uh, has occurred since you've been provost, and it's great to have you part of this, and uh, it's also great to see you taking a leadership and thinking about where the university should go, and stimulating us to think not just about what we should do tomorrow or the day after, but how we can think uh, years ahead about how to make this the most vital, engaging place, and clearly social justice from the conversations that you've already had with literally hundreds of faculty and staff and students uh, has resonated with that group. A thousand. A thousand <laughs> uh, faculty, staff, and students uh, so far in the process. Uh, that, that, that term has resonated, and yet um, uh, we wrestle as an institution with, with what that means. People sometimes say, gee, isn't that kind of fuzzy? Don't we need to sharpen it? What what does it require of us? What are our opportunities in really enacting it? And I think your process really encourages us to, to ask that question in, in broader and deeper ways and not just be satisfied with a general feel-good rhetoric about uh, the university's commitments in these areas. And so with that in mind, uh, I thought this was a terrific opportunity to take advantage 
uh, of members of the board of the center. For those of you who don't know the work of the center as well, uh, the center, which was founded in 1998, focuses on issues of international justice, coexistence to, and, in divided societies, and social justice more broadly as a campus entity. So we work with judges who serve on international courts and tribunals. We work with artists and peace builders who are working <coughs> together to help uh, uh, bring peace to divided societies around the world. And we also uh, do programs here on campus and provide opportunities for students in the Sorensen Fellowship and other opportunities to engage in uh, global uh, communities uh, as well as uh, local action. And those of you, I hope that there are a number of you in this room who participated in our DICE Impact Festival of Social Justice, the university's first festival of social justice that took place in February. Uh, that too had more than 1,000 uh, students participate in more than 30 events over the course of the week. Uh, but today we have a chance to look forward. Once a year, uh, members of the advisory board of, uh, of the center come together. And, and this is really a, an extraordinary group of people who are involved uh, locally, nationally, and internationally in work related to justice, to ethics, to coexistence in divided societies. And six members of that board are with us today to really ask the question, uh, where can Brandeis go in relation to its social justice mission? What does that mean? What are our opportunities? What are our challenges? What do we have to think hard about? Um, each of these uh, people around the table could easily give a full talk on the subject and hold us uh, entranced. We'll, but we decided to really set this up as a conversation uh, so that we could really kind of go back and forth a little bit and involve you as well. Um, I'm going to dispense with long biographies of each of them because each has a very long and distinguished career and we take up our entire time with that. But I will tell you briefly about the six people who are here uh, in addition to Provost Goldstein and myself uh, and, and then we'll get the conversation started. To my immediate right is Richard Goldstone. Uh, Judge Goldstone is the chair of the center's advisory board uh, and he is best known as a uh, uh, as a judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, the chair of the Goldstone Commission that made a, a crucial uh, intervention in helping reduce violence in the period right before apartheid ended. He was the first prosecutor for the international tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in The Hague. Uh, and uh, since retiring as a justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, he's been involved in a series of high-level uh, commissions and activities. Uh, notable on this campus was his leadership of the UN Commission that investigated uh, the conflict in Gaza. Uh, and we had a very, uh, uh, very interesting program where he spoke uh, shortly after that report was released a couple of years ago. Hans Karel, uh, next uh, down, uh, is from Sweden. He is the former Under Secretary General for the, of the United Nations for Legal Affairs. That means he's essentially the UN's top lawyer. Uh, and in that role, he performed a, a whole series of important things, but he is in some ways best known for his work supporting the international uh, criminal tribunals for Rwanda and uh, Yugoslavia, and also for his key role in the uh, conference in Rome that uh, established the International Criminal Court, um, which, by the way, will be issuing uh, its first uh, uh, judgment uh, in The Hague uh, on Wednesday of this week. So that's going to be a very interesting uh, day for the ICC. So Hans Karel, a, a giant in the figure of international criminal justice. Uh, Norbert Weisberg, uh, to, to his right, is the chairman of Package Research Laboratory, uh, a businessman, a lawyer, and uh, a, uh, a man whose commitment to the center is really a kind of family commitment. He's been involved with the center since the very beginning. Uh, his wife, Judy Schneider, who's with us also, has been a member of the board of our center. And Judy's father, Abe Feinberg, was really the uh, initial founder, the man with the initial vision for the center back in the 1990s. So uh, Abe Feinberg's spirit continues with us, and we're very grateful for Norbert and Judy's continuing contributions to our board. Continuing on to the left, uh, we have Michael Ratner, uh, Brandeis University class of 1966, uh, so an alum at the table, so we're very happy to have his, uh, particularly have his perspective on his, his alma mater. 
Um, Michael Ratner is the President uh, Emeritus of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. Uh, in that capacity, uh, and in his capacity as a lawyer, he has uh, challenged authority all over the world, uh, best known perhaps in recent years for the Center's uh, active litigation on, uh, on Guantanamo. Uh, but he has been involved in a whole series of uh, uh, action on behalf of victims in places as diverse as Guatemala, East Timor, Haiti, and Argentina. And his recent book uh, is called Hell No, Your Right to Dissent in 21st Century America. Perhaps that will resonate in Brandeis's social justice mission as well. Continuing to the left, we have uh, Justice Sharani Tilakawardene, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court in Sri Lanka. She was the first woman appointed as a Court of Appeal judge in her country, and as you can imagine, uh, a, uh, someone who has uh, been very active not only as uh, a judge in her own country issuing some very controversial rulings against her own government, some controversial and courageous rulings, but also a leader on issues of gender and justice throughout South Asia and indeed throughout the whole world, involved really in a whole series of very important efforts to help sensitize judges in countries all over the region about issues of gender, uh, about issues of domestic violence, and uh, she's been uh, a very uh, active and helpful member of our Centrist Board for many years. And finally, to the left here, uh, Diego Aria, uh, who uh, is from Venezuela, uh, a career as a political figure and a diplomat. Uh, he served as the governor of uh, Caracas. He went on to be the Venezuela's permanent representative to the United Nations. Uh, and in that uh, guise, he also served as the President of the Security Council during a very important period in the 1990s. Uh, if I'm just permitted to say something I kind of discovered about Diego today, um, Diego is famous for having uh, created something called the ARIA formula in the United Nations, which permits um, representatives from uh, NGOs and other non-governmental organizations to be able to talk informally with members of the Security Council in a way to kind of bring facts and, do, and alternative perspectives into what's otherwise a kind of very stale and compartmentalized debate. And it occurred to me as we were talking about this while we walked by the statue of Louis Brandeis that in a way Diego's work in diplomacy is a kind of anal uh, analogy to the Brandeis brief uh, that is to say, Louis Brandeis himself famous for bringing to the law a sense of facts and social circumstances to complicate the technical aspects of the law. And I think in some ways what Diego did at the Security Council is a kind of analog to, uh, to, to Brandeis's uh, contributions. So all six of these people really resonate in different ways with the mission of Brandeis University. They've been uh, strong contributors, and it's great to, to have them welcome them here. Please join me in welcoming them all. So we'll start this as a conversation. Uh, I, we said no, we weren't going to do prepared presentations, but so we'll try to kind of organize this informally and uh, offer opportunities for kind of conversation uh, back and forth. Um, so uh, I really just want to start by asking you to help us think about um, what social justice means in a university context, the extent to which you think that universities have a kind of obligation to make social justice a part of their mission, but if so, what kinds of responsibilities and obligations does that entail? What are the opportunities for us you know, there's some debate within this country uh, among, uh, a, along a spectrum that says, on the one hand, universities should be very much involved in engaging, uh, acting as agents of social justice, as well as engaging students along those lines. But there are others who say, you know, it's the university's business simply to teach, to provide knowledge, and that to be too active runs the risk of becoming a kind of ideological a uh, factory rather than a place where ideas are and not generally uh, disseminated. But even if you agree on issues that, that social justice is, is, is central, you have to take a, an, another step to ask what that actually means. I'm going to pose just a couple of what I think are sort of harder cases, which you may or may not wish to address, and you may have your own individual cases that you want to bring forward. 
So two cases, it seems to me, that may be on our minds, especially right now with the, uh, in the world situation and in, um, that have emerged in our kind of public discourse. One is the question of access to education and equality. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about the cost of higher education in the United States and also the extent to which um, universities have, in some ways, be, especially elite universities, more and more, it's been more and more difficult for uh, those with less uh, resources to be able to find their way into them, either both to pay for them or even to gain admission. Uh, there are figures that say that of the bottom quartile of the, in the United States, only three per, only three percent of uh, the, uh, the student population of American universities comes out of that bottom quartile of economic. What, is, what what responsibilities does that create for the institution? What in what ways does the universe, the social a social justice mission require some forms of institutional action on issues of access to education, and how might that resonate from the, in the various countries where you've been? And another issue to kind of throw on the table is the issue of um, what a social justice mission means in terms of a distant issue. So we've talked about one very close issue, a distant issue like issues of mass violence overseas. What's happening in Syria right now is dominating public discourse, uh, and uh, policymakers are debating the extent to which form various forms of sanctions or intervention might be necessary or desirable. Is there a role that universities can or should be playing in that? Um, I'm also thinking of the recent big splash that the Coney 2012 video has made in relation to international justice, uh, something that's a, uh, of great concern to, to this group. Um, while that wasn't made by a college student, it was made certainly to appeal to the generation of, of, of students here. And uh, the question is whether you think that kind of um, social media action is something that universities should be engaged in in some explicit way, or is that best left to uh, outside actors? So I throw those more difficult cases into the mix, but you may bring your own ideas. So with those preliminaries, um, I invite someone to jump right in. Richard? Well, we're here to give, us, to give it a go at the beginning, the, uh, beginning of the discussion. I think, as Dan has indicated, I think, well, before I even get there, let, let me say, I'm sure there's nobody in this room uh, who, who, who wouldn't agree that universities should get involved with issues of social justice. Um, that, that, that's part, part of the nature of the university. But as, uh, as Dan Terrace has indicated, I think, I think there are two different issues. The one is the question of getting involved in issues of social justice that affect your own country, and even more particularly your own university, your own state. Uh, the, the, the second to which Dan referred is the, the extent to which universities, and students in particular, should get involved and be encouraged to get involved with regard to huge issues involving the international, the, the international world. Uh, Dan has given Syria as uh, as the example. <coughs> my, my own view, from certainly from my experience in South Africa, is that universities, I believe, and students would be well advised to get involved specifically and mainly in relation to issues where they can speak with some expertise about their own university, about students in their country and about issues which affect them as students. I think, I think their voices will mean more if they speak about issues on which they have and will develop expertise. I'm not suggesting they shouldn't get involved in broader issues, but that should be, that should be the main focus. And uh, let, me give, let me give one example from my own student days way back uh, in the 1960s. Uh, when South Africa was in the worst of its apartheid year, and students really led the drive to stop the government, the then uh, apartheid government, introducing apartheid into the universities, and the thwarting their attempts, their very serious attempts, to stop what they regarded as white universities from having black students, and there were questions of academic freedom. 
and uh, and it was the it, it, it was international the international involvement of students, particularly from this country, that made a huge difference to those to those those of us in the open universities, as they were called, uh, which which fought against excluding black students from our from our campus and from our classrooms, uh, it was uh, the, the American and, 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 and a number of European universities uh, who made a huge difference in giving support and giving, giving voice uh, to, to, the, to, uh, to, to the issue. So I think here, here the, the policy of the national student organization that, that really led the student anti-apartheid movement, it really formulated the policy in those years of not attacking the whole apartheid system, but rather concentrating on university apartheid, which affected us directly uh, as uh, a student. Richard, before I turn to another, I can't resist one quick follow-up. When I was in college, I participated in some marches encouraging my university to divest from South Africa. But that was a very distant issue for me, and one about which I had, frankly, no expertise at all. <laughs> Was that a bad idea? Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, the, the, the question of divestment in South Africa was very controversial. I had the privilege of being friendly with, 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 with the late Helen Sussman. She, she had strong views against divestment <coughs> and, 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 and boycotts. And, and, and the reason she was opposed to it was she felt that it was that the people who would suffer from them were the very people who wanted to be helped. It was black South Africans who, who would uh, lose employment and not have food to eat because of divestment and, and, and economic boycotts against South Africa. I had a different view. Um, and the, the reason I had a different view was that it was the black leaders who on behalf of their people were calling for divestment. And I remember saying to Helen Sussman, I don't believe it li lies in the mouths of white South Africans to oppose divestment when the leaders of the black community are calling for it. And it's their call. And I believe, I, 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 it seemed to me to be morally questionable whether their call should be, should be opposed because white South Africans <coughs> believed it wasn't in their interest. Sharani, it looked like you were ready to yeah. jump in. No, she's got a mic there. I'll take that. Mm. I think the original definition of equal uh, of social justice was about equality and equal opportunity. And I think now it has a larger meaning. It has a wider spectrum. And it really talks of the full and equal participation of all citizens <coughs> in economic, social, and political aspects of the nation. And its authority is derived from codes of morality and culture. Each culture differs from each other. So depends on what morality comes from that particular culture. Um, one of the things, I, 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 an example I remember when, uh, the, the, when you talk of social justice, you're talking sometimes about issues which are being observed globally. If I can just give it in a simple example, I remember talking with a professor from India who told me, you know, Every person all over the world, especially in South Asia, where they really want to educate their children, because in a way, education is obtaining social justice. It's a methodology to obtain social justice and equality, <coughs> where everything else is loaded against them because of economic stratifications. And he said, look what happened in America. The people who occupied Wall Street, who made these investment bankers, and they were the best of the Ivy Leagues, universities of the you know universities that we talk of like Yale and Cambridge and Oxford. These were the best of the best. What is it in that education which did not help them to realize or observe that this was going to happen? How did they miss it? Because these were the best of the best. How did they miss realizing that this was going to be the result in a very short time because it was not a foreseeable thing for them. And was it something in the way we educate people? Is it something in the very structure of the education which in a way builds up a certain insularity and makes it very subjective? It's about the other job, what I can do about it without the observance of the impact 
on those accessing those services. Isn't there a kind of trusteeship that must be built into the education to see that every act that one does, once you have reached this pinnacle of education, must be analyzed in a way as how does it impact the fellow occupants of the planet? How does it impact? How does my a decision taken, taken about finance in a particular country, in a particular strata of society, how does it impact the poorest of the poor in a third world nation? How does it impact the environment? How does it impact equality? How does it impact the women? How does it impact the children? I mean, when you think today that the third largest money-making um, investment is in pornography, it's a 97 billion um, investment, return per year. So does, is this, what are we focusing on? And should the students in all the universities in all the world start talking about the trusteeship, the obligations, and the realizations, not just of theories and practical um, ideologies, how does those play out in, in its realization to society? What is the impact of each and every decision or a collective amount of decisions? And I think this is what students need to start analyzing. Universities need to analyze. The education, the educated professionals need to analyze in a, in a larger, because we are no longer countries with borders. We are a globalized nation. Communication has sought you that you can get 70, what was the figure you said, 78 million off on the according to 2012. So what are we? We are a, a planet of people. So should we not be thinking of the impact of our decisions at every level on the other? So that we do it very Great. Well, I, I want to turn and we can keep thinking about how exactly as a university we keep that focus on that question of, of, of impact, because I think that's very nicely said. Michael? Yeah, I, thanks, Dan. I, I want to mention what Dan's first point was about the obligations with regard to particularly private university students' uh, equality. And you know, being in an office where we hire or try and hire many, many social justice activists, lawyers and others, uh, you realize very quickly that the issue of student debt is absolutely crucial to how people are able to spend the first number of years of their lives uh, in social action or doing social activist work. They come out of a law school with $150,000 in debt, they're not gonna work in my office. Um, they have to go to a big law firm, they have to pay back that debt. Yes, there's some forgiveness programs, etc. So one thing I would like to see, I mean, I love, in that sense, I just love the European system. I love a system where students graduate from college uh, or graduate school without any debt at all. Um, now, that may just be a fantasy in this country, um, but it's certainly one uh, that I would think is crucial if we're thinking of really having people in our society who are able to put their, their careers uh, into social justice. Um, otherwise, it's a very, very, very difficult. Um, on the second issue of Syria, um, and this is where I might share a little bit of what Richard's saying, but maybe a little different perspective. If I look at, if you look at Syria, um, and then you think about all of a sudden there's this huge activism around Syria, and then you ask yourself, well, the U.S. just fought a many years illegal war in Iraq, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and yet, where's the activism around that? Uh, and the lesson I get from that, and it's for, been for me as a social activist my whole career, uh, is I focus, because it's the area I know and it's what my country is doing, I focus, I begin my focus with what my country is doing um, that I want to correct or change. Uh, so it's not that I'm saying one shouldn't get active to stop humanitarian disasters everywhere in the world, uh, but there's a first obligation, I think, uh, to go to your own country and say, stop it, especially when your country is the most powerful country uh, in the world in carrying out uh, many of the activities uh, that we object to. Uh -huh. uh, I thought about it. Um, 
That's another two points. And the third point I would make is that we're talking about these big issues, uh, but I just came back from uh, Florida where there was a six-day hunger strike by tomato workers um, in Lakeland, Florida against public supermarkets so they can get a penny a pound more for their tomatoes. Coalition for Auckland Workers. So I look at these big issues, but I also look at home at what I would call the most marginalized people in our society and think that that's a place uh, where when I'm thinking about social justice, action, and activities, um, that's certainly a place that I would want to see uh, people in this country uh, particularly working. Uh, and then I'll just close quickly. I mean, I went to this school, and of course, at the time in the 60s, and at the time when I was in law school at Columbia in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, they were really, uh, there were no classes around anything to do with social justice or social activism. And it was outside when that happened. Of course, in the 60s here, we had the Civil Rights Movement. We had the beginning of the war in Vietnam, you know, middle of the war, early part of the war in Vietnam. Um, we had ban the bomb. And I remember the debates here when we would hit the picket lines and stuff on, on the bomb or anything. There were some professors who said, get back in the classroom, go home and listen to Bach. They said that to other professors. Your place is not out on, uh, out on the picket line or out on protesting the bomb or civil rights. Um, now that, I think that debate is over, actually, and I, think, I agree with, with what Richard said about that. I don't think that's any longer uh, a valid approach to take. It was the same at Columbia, but worse. I mean, 300 young men, all, except for 10 of us, being prepared to go to Wall Street and, and be business lawyers. Um, and that, of course, changed in 68 when the entire law school in Columbia was turned on its head. Um, and now, of course, there's scores of classes, clinics and otherwise, that I've taught um, at Columbia and other places in which you are bringing into the law school the social justice activities of the surrounding uh, area. Uh, so I, I feel very strongly that it's part of the university, uh, but it's particularly part of it um, when it comes to uh, what our own country uh, is doing in the world. Uh, yes, well, of course, I agree with the sentiment around the table that the university has a very critical place in the area of social justice. Uh, up to now, uh, they have, uh, the universities have played that role around instructing students. Uh, I think there's another aspect of the university's place in the war in favor of social justice that they have not fought well, and I'll come to that in a second. In, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, instructing students, I think that the university's place, first and foremost, is to teach students how to think for themselves. We're living in an era of a 1.17 second sound bite between commercials. And uh, not merely students, but many people simply take the voiced opinion of whoever the talking head is at the time on the TV set as true. Uh, and sometimes it is, but often it is not. And uh, if the university could bring uh, its uh, intelligence to bear on, uh, on instructing students to take a step backward, think for themselves, and actually come up with independent opinions about the issues around them, it would be a very helpful thing. Uh, secondly, to think with empathy, <clears throat> to think about issues of social justice, while at the same time placing oneself in the shoes of the person who may have a different point of view. Perhaps one of the singularly difficult parts of understanding how ultimately to reach a conclusion on some of these complex issues is to understand that typically there is another side of the coin. And to understand why people support that side of the coin is a difficult thing, particularly if you have a restricted amount of time within which to do it. So uh, part and parcel of that as well, uh, universities ought to be concentrating on teaching their students how to listen. Uh, too, many, too many times, I think each of us is guilty about this. We are apt to want to force our opinion on people uh, without understanding that they have an opinion as well and deserve the time to mount it. Uh, people are very uncomfortable with complexity. They prefer clarity. And in the issue, in the, in the area of social justice, issues of social justice, Clarity typically uh, has to do with uh, polemic, polemics, people like Rush Limbaugh and perhaps on the other side of the coin, Rachel Maddow, uh, a deal with very clear uh, pronunciamentos, but they are for the most part ideologically 
suspect. And uh, uh, it, when one comes to the middle of the of the issues, one uh, uh, encounters uh, confusion and complexity, and one needs to be calm uh, in the face of that complexity. And one needs to relax and understand that it's, sometimes it's even fun to debate these issues. It's like a game. One should look forward to playing the game. And when one plays the game slowly and calmly, one actually learns. Uh, <clears throat> those are some of the responsibilities I think a university has in respect of its student body in the area of social justice. What I'm a little at sea about, however, is the concessions that the university has made in my lifetime, and I suppose in the life of most universities, in, in conceding the, uh, the area of, 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 of public demonstration of social issues to the media, and playing a very, very small role in demonstrating publicly the university's state of mind. I wonder at that, because there are very few entities uh, that I can think of in the world but for universities. <clears throat> specializing in scholarship and research as they do, that likely can form as uh, interesting an opinion on social issues uh, as they can, and yet they are virtually silent publicly about those issues. One reads occasionally in articles such as The Opinionator in the Times or The Ethicist, I believe that's in the Times as well, I'm not sure, where individuals are willing to speak out on issues of social justice and where the ethical and moral uh, uh, side of the issues are and indeed even to reach conclusions about which side of those ethical and moral issues is the, is the more correct one. But universities are silent about that. Instead we are left to a corrupt media, people who, who are responsible to sponsors or to owners or for whatever reason uh, uh, seek to uh, maximize their profits uh, to, uh, to learn about these issues and to uh, feed us with information enough to make conclusions about what is most moral. I think somehow or other universities need to come to grips with their responsibility to speak out. <coughs> they are cheating the world of their knowledge. The world needs their knowledge, public knowledge make their knowledge on these social issues public. Now I fear, uh, as has been described here, the, the framework of this issue is one of intellectual purity. Uh, I fear that that's not the case. I fear that what really is involved here is the same difficulty that corrupts the media, and that is a university's fear that were they to take a position as to what is most moral, what's most ethical, that they would somehow sever uh, the interest of uh, large contributors uh, and, uh, and thereby harm the university. And I dare say that that's a risk that is palpable and real. Uh, but they must come to grips with their responsibility to inform the public as well. We, we have a right to rely on the universities to inform the public and to take public stands on these issues. And uh, I'm interested to know whether uh, university officials agree with that. Yeah, I, I want to I turn to this question because it, I think we'll, we'll, we'll want as we move forward to kind of divide our, our thinking into sort of three different kinds of areas in which social justice touches on university life. One is within the curriculum. One is the kind of work that faculty and students can do in the way of research and, and action. And then the third is this question of institutional behavior uh, that touches on both the issue of equality that Michael raised and the issue of speaking out that you just did. But before I turn it back to Steve for some thoughts on some of those things, I want to get make sure Diego has a chance to weigh in. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> you know, Dean, uh, uh, also, also this morning, I was talking to Dan, walking around campus, and I told him, listen, I have the privilege to bring up the Diario Formula, Justice Goldsman, when he produced the famous Goldsman report for South Africa which actually started the movement to uh, instrument that, uh, that formula, that policy of the United Nations. I think you were the second or third person who was in that. You know, I don't think you're going to have a problem with this university and how to encourage students to be active on social justice. When I came in, I saw someone with a t-shirt that says, uh, Brandeis student or something like that, for Palestinian justice. And uh, at Brandeis. 
you know, that was the first thing I noticed when I was going into the room. The kind of courses that I've seen here in the eight years that I've been part of the center of this board have uh, led me to believe that in one of the few places we will never have that problem to generate the, the enthusiasm, the concern, and the preoccupation to be active on social justice. I don't think that would be the case. Uh, I think in the last year, I've spoken about 25 universities several times in my country, Venezuela. And uh, when I listen to the concern that you have here, I have to tell you one. For example, I, was, I used to ask a question to the students in the universities. I said, uh, I would pick anyone. I said, uh, listen, tell me what is your dream. And the guy, 18, 19 years old, stood up and said, to live in peace. And I said, you know, if I have asked that question to somebody in Harvard or in Berlin or in Tokyo, probably would have asked a motorcycle, a bike, an iPad, not for peace, and to live in peace. That's become a major issue in my country. So when you think of values and people and social justice, peace becomes at the national level, not because they are concerned there is no peace in Syria or in Rwanda or in Zimbabwe, whatever. No, there is no peace for them because uh, uh, some of them live in poor areas, where they may be shot at night, uh, they have to sleep on their bed because of people shooting around them. So that's when you start to, to understand that uh, which are, what is social justice for many of them and how different those concepts of social justice can be from what I'm here and, and Boston or Caracas or Tegucigalpa or Guatemala where things are completely different. On the, the issue of Syria, I think Hans and I, also Richard, have an experience. How high is the threshold of the United Nations to intervene? More than the United Nations is always playing for what the international community doesn't want to do, is extremely high. We saw what happened in Rwanda and Bosnia. Uh, we are looking now at the threshold in Syria. We have not been reached. Maybe the threshold, there need to be 20,000 people killed. It's only 9,000. So probably that's still not enough to act. So uh, in the social justice, it's an issue that is actually not discussed at the level of the Security Council. That concept is non-existent. The concept is completely different. It doesn't matter to us, should we do it, can we do it? It is a completely different exercise that we are now talking about. And this I see for what I have experimented and felt myself. Uh, and the point that, you know, that the priority should be the theme of the students, I agree with Richard, but at the same time, in a country like mine, the students have always been fundamental in the major changes of the country. Throughout the 20th century, every time there was a major problem without the students involved, it would have been completely impossible to, to affect changes. So it depends in which country you are. I understand perfectly well the, the motivation that Richard has explained, and I agree, but I believe that youth in our countries are the the most powerful force that exists in societies like mine, because they have more sense of solidarity, they are much more generous, and they are much more wholesome. And they will do what the rest of the population wouldn't do. They are fearless, they are courageous. And I personally base my optimism in my country precisely in the force, precisely of these people, of the young people in my country. Great. Steve, can I turn to you and ask how this is? Oh, you want to respond to that, Hans? Sure. No, I haven't. Have I? You have oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, My apologies. Yeah, no, because uh, as I indicated to you down before this um, conversation, I felt a need to structure the discussion. Um, and in my thinking, I, I came to three dimensions. And I think it's very important to make a distinction between the three. The first dimension is the academic dimension, the curricula, the research and so forth at, at university, I understand yeah, that there is sort of a, a competition here between values and facts and, and that some people don't like that universities should get involved in, in um, the topic we are discussing here. The second dimension is the university administration. And the third dimension I choose to call life on campus. And let me explain these three dimensions. The first dimension, of course, is if you are studying mathematics or physics or chemistry, then the facts, that's that what counts. But when you get into philosophy, social sciences, political sciences and law, you can't just look at facts. 
you have to look also at the social dimension, the values. And basically, this is extremely important to instill in the students some ethical values that they can carry with them in life based on experience from previous generations. And one of my criticisms of many actors at high levels in the international world is why is it so difficult to transfer wisdom from one generation to another? I can go as far back as Sophocles to prove my point. I don't, I don't intend to do that now. But anyway, so this I think is extremely important. And also, uh, if you were looking at elements like, for example, human rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, rules of human rights, the empowerment of women, these are elements that have to be like a, 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 a red thread through all the topics that you think of them all the time, that you have to keep them in mind. Then, of course, you come to the university administration. And basically, they should focus on administration in the first place. But this doesn't mean that they couldn't involve, get involved also in, in, in uh, what we are discussing here, depending on the situation in the country. In Europe, in many countries, students are allowed to go to universities without a fee. Of course, they have to have their daily subsistence and so forth. They have then loans that they can take up um, but on, equal, on an equal basis. So basically, the system is forged in such a way that all young people who have the qualifications, who have the will to go to university, should have that chance at the university. If this doesn't exist in your country, for example, well then, I think maybe the university administration could look at the question, are there systems we could apply at our university, for example, scholarships or something else, to allow students who otherwise would not have a chance to come to your university to study there. I think this is extremely important. And then also another dimension of the university administration, and that touches upon what others have said here, uh, Norbert and, and, and uh, Diego Arias and others, that yes, the university could also engage in a more general discussion by, for example, organizing events or arrangements uh, at the university where they take a uh, to the forefront in the, in the kind of issues that we are discussing here that Dan put questions about, for example, the situation in Syria. And then we come to the very important part of the life on campus. Basically, this is what the students decide to do at any particular point in time. And here, I think the ceiling should be extremely high. Because basically, if students want to engage in, for example, the situation in Syria, or the situation in South Africa, in those days, or the situation somewhere else, who could prevent them from doing it. <coughs> Basically, this boils down to what in human rights term is called freedom of association. The students have a right to get together, to form an association or whatever, to deal with a particular issue. And I don't think that the university administration then should just try to put a lid on that, because that would be violating their human rights to freedom of expression, to association, and so forth. Certainly, they have to observe the standards of human rights, also that you can't, by your own exercise of human rights, violate the human rights of others. I think these are extremely important uh, elements here. Let me finish by making a reference to Doug Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who died in a plane crash at Andorra 50 years ago last year. We had celebrations uh, of, of his uh, commemorations of his, of his life. In his last report to the General Assembly in 1961, he actually discussed topics that were very well were fall under social justice. He looked at the whole world and said, we can't have justice in the world, you have a right to do, unless all countries are allowed to develop. The people must be allowed to develop their situation so they can participate in this also. And I will end by one of his markings that I used to greet new um, members of the legal office in the UN, welcome to, to my office. And it, it, exactly <coughs> what we are discussing here, the very short marking from his book, Markings, is the following. Openness to life gives a swift insight, like a flash of lightning, into the life situation of others. A must to force the problem from its emotional sting into a clearly conceived intellectual form and act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Very elegant. Very good. Wow.
that's, that's exciting. And it's an interesting opportunity to respond. And I, I feel like I will wear an administration hat and at the same and 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 try and, and yet be fully responsive. Um, from the curriculum standpoint, to take it the way we're we were discussing, I think that each of you has, or many of you have touched on, on what is the essence of a Brandeis education, what the purpose of a Brandeis education is. Um, it, it, a liberal arts education, as understood at Brandeis, is about empathy. It's about complexity. It's about listening and thinking um, and openness to opinions. Because the purpose of a liberal arts education is many faceted. One goal is to produce graduates who go into the world so that the world which changes so quickly and they don't know what is going to come for them, they will be able to think about answers. We don't teach facts at a university when we're teaching liberal arts because facts become dated very quickly and what our students need to know is how to think through a problem where the question hasn't even been asked yet. So I, I agree 100% with, with what everyone is speaking about as the goal of the curriculum. And I think that we're comfortable here at the institution on that score. Um, I think that it also addresses the issue of, of self-interest or understanding the impact of what you do. Because the education is meant to look back to the past to learn from it, to understand what it felt like to be someone else in that story, and then to move forward yourself through the world. So I think that resonates easily with all of what we cherish about an idea of social justice. I think in terms of the way we um, uh, do our scholarship and the experiential learning component of what we do at the university, it also speaks to being engaged in the real world now, as it exists, to experience it as others experience it and bring ourselves to it. Um, I think that uh, the inst interesting question of the role of the institution in social justice is, for me, more nuanced. Um, our goal is to help each student and each scholar pursue their dreams for impacting the world. Not tell them what their dreams should be, but give them the skills to pursue that, give, help them develop the potential to pursue that. And that means that the institution should not sil never silence anyone, nor in our silence about an opinion as an institution, that, that means we are speaking what we've learned, but not being advocates. So I would, I would say that an institution shouldn't advocate. It should be a source of facts. It should be a source of knowledge. It should be an open place for discussion. Um, and and so, so I don't think we're silent. I think we just, we just don't advocate. And that's different than our students being advocates and our scholars being advocates. But the institution's role is to be a safe place where whatever your opinion is, it can be explored in depth and expressed openly. In terms of the other aspect of the university, which is its role in society, that is not neutral. I think that access is the first point. And at this institution, Access is not limited by need. Anyone who wants to come, we work to make it financially possible. And we, they do, no one would say no because of the finances. And that costs us a great deal, which is why we invest, we invest so much in it, there are other things that we can't invest in as quickly as we would like to. So that is a commitment of the institution. Um, I think that the, 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 the question of debt through education and society is it's a very important one. And I think that the idea of endowing more and more of the education so that people carry less with them. Um, uh, now, again, I will put my, my administration hat fully on and say that the students who graduate from, with a bachelor's from Brandeis 
carry less debt than other private institutions and only as much or less than many who go to public institutions in the United States. We pride ourselves on that. And we pride ourselves on the fact that such a large um, uh, proportion of our class is first generation in, in university. So those are a few responses. Great. I, I want to turn it over in a second for some student commentary. Um, but before I do, I can't resist prodding you on one follow-up related to the question of need. Um, you, you articulate the university's commitment to meeting student need. But one of the critiques of our kind of universities, and I don't mean that it's been applied specifically to Brandeis, but one of the critiques is that our admissions policies in effect disadvantage those at the lower end of society economically because those at the higher end have so many more advantages in terms of things like preparation for SAT, educational advantages, and so forth. So saying that we need need is fine, a small number of people from the lower quartile, let's say, economically will make it into our institution and do, but still proportional to the population as a whole, we still underserve that group and that gap has been widening over the last generation. Do we have a responsibility? I think we absolutely do have a responsibility. I think that the pipeline issue, which we talk about often at, at more senior levels, um, needs to be looked at more at, uh, at older levels, needs to be looked at at all levels. And again, in terms of this institution, our transitional year program reaches out to, to help students have the skills they would need to succeed in a place that really demands excellence and a skill set and you want to bring people in and not only help them but you want them to have the skills to succeed and take what they can so that's a transitional year program that we have in addition brandeis um it, it has a posse program where we reach into the communities and create a networking structure that supports underrepresented minorities coming in and so that they can succeed in this demanding environment. On top of that, Brandeis created the Science Posse program, which is the exact same thing that we've had for the general undergraduate population, but to bring in students who are focused on, this, on STEM, and our fourth year students are now just getting accepted to graduate school and medical school, and that is now being replicated at three other institutions. And we are in the process now of working with Debbie Beal from the Posse Foundation to create graduate Posse so that students can move into the graduate education. That still doesn't mean we don't have to think with society about what it is we need to do so that students um, who need our help in elementary school um, uh, and in high school, we can reach down into society through our educational programs. But at this point, our focus has been where we have our experience. Um, and, and I'll just say one more thing because I thought it was lovely. Both um, uh, the two of you spoke about um, working from your own experience if you're a student, um, or um, beginning with what your own country is doing. And in a sense, in both places, it's, 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 it's talking about taking responsibility. Um, I, I trained as a physician, and we call it, our phrase for it is at least do no harm. If it's your country, if it's what you know about, starting there seems like a very strong place to go. So I would add my voice to that as well.